I hope everyone is doing well, and we will go ahead and get started tonight with our Wave Sheaf offering service. This is a very unique and special service in that it is very important relative to our overall salvation and the plan of salvation. And we'll get started. If I, I would ask that you would please bow your head and we'll ask a quick blessing upon the service. Our Father in heaven, we come before you. We give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for all the blessings of life you've given to us. We thank you for the great opportunity that we have for salvation through Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Jesus, for what you endured on our behalf to give us that opportunity. We come before you now and pray and ask for your presence and guidance. Help our minds to grasp, appreciate, and as we acknowledge what has been done on our behalf. We give you thanks and ask all of this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, this is an annual service that we have been keeping for quite some time for the very purposes of acknowledging what Jesus Christ has done for us. And when we think about this time of the year, we think about the Passover. The Passover certainly symbolizes our redemption from this world and the forgiveness of our sins. But we also know during this time of year, we have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which typifies our lifelong task of truly coming out of sin and putting on the new person in sincerity and truth. And certainly that is pictured, as we know, through the bread of life, which was Jesus Christ himself, the unleavened bread. And it is important, I think, when we consider this, that we consider what we see in the writings of the Old Testament relative to what we see in the book of Leviticus and all of the offerings that were offered, beginning in chapter 1, going all the way into chapter 6. And it's interesting because when we look at that in the Old Testament, it describes many offerings that the Israelites utilized in their worship of God that God told them to offer in the form of burnt offerings, meal offerings, peace offerings, sin offerings, trans transpass offerings. And then we have a very unique special occasion that we're going to look at tonight. And when we look at this particular offering, this was a unique offering that was offered one time a year, and it was for the very purposes of signifying something far greater. It is very easy to consider the fact that the wave sheaf offering can be overlooked somewhat relative to all the events that go on with the Passover and the meanings of the Days of Unleavened Bread, yet... This particular offering, this particular situation that we're going to read in Leviticus 23 points to something that is not obscure in any means. In fact, you could say that without it, it mean, and what it means to our salvation, there would truly be no salvation. That is how important this is. We'll begin by turning over to Leviticus chapter 23. This is where we find the instruction that the Israelites were given. And it was something that was like many things relative to all of the offerings offered in Leviticus 1 through 6 that symbolized something else that would later become evident. But beginning in verse 9, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel. And say to them, when you enter the land which I am going to give you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring in the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord for you to be accepted on the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Now on the day goes on to say in verse 12, when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb, one year old, without defect, for a burnt offering to the Lord. 
Its grain offering shall be of two-tenths of an ephod of fine flour mixed with oil and an offering by fire to the Lord for a soothing aroma with its drink offering a fourth of a hen of wine until the same day until when you brought in the offering of your Lord of your God rather you shall eat neither bread nor roast grain nor new growth it is to be a perpetual statute throughout your generations and all your dwelling places I find that again very interesting that it is perpetual it is to be acknowledged which is what we are doing tonight verse 15 and you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath which was a weekly Sabbath from the day when you brought in the sheep of the wave offering there shall be seven complete weekly Sabbaths and you shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath which will be your 50th day and then you shall present a new grain offering to the Lord and you shall bring in from your dwelling places two loaves of bread for a wave offering made of two tenths of an ephod and they shall be of fine flour baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord along with the bread you shall present seven one-year-old lambs without defect and a bull of the herd and two rams that they be of the burnt offering to the Lord with the grain offering and the drink offering and an offering of fire of a soothing aroma to the Lord and you shall offer one male goat for a sin offering and two male lambs one year old for a sacrifice of a peace offering the priest shall then wave them from the bread of the first fruits of a wave offering with two lambs before the Lord and they are to be holy to the Lord for the priest on the self on the same day you shall make a proclamation as well you are to have a holy convocation and you are to do no laborious work it is to be a perpetual statute in all of your dwelling places throughout your generations the interesting aspect of what we're seeing here and I've on the screen put forth a couple of things for us to consider the wave off or sheaf rather consisted of an omer of barley still on a stalk that was cut at the beginning of the spring harvest initially each Israelite was who possessed a harvest was required to give an offering so it was individually and the priest would wave that offering before God for acceptance one official wave of, of the sheaf was done by the priest in Jerusalem and that became something that was occurring during the second temple period which was the period when Jesus Christ would have been here on the earth and they decided at that point to have one waving in the actual temple itself in Jerusalem and that was presented once for all I think you see a parallel there with Hebrews referencing the fact that Jesus Christ was a offering once for all but you see that as a result of that the wave sheaf offering represented something it represented a grateful acknowledgement to God of what God was giving in the form of a harvest and it also because it was the first portion of these first fruits of this first grain it was a dedication and it was a consecrating this harvest to God himself I find it interesting as well when we consider the details of what we've gone through and I know there were a lot of details in verses 20 or 9 rather verses through 21 the priest began to make this first cutting as we understand based on the writings from the Mishnah right as the Sabbath was ending so we're pretty close right now at this time of this day of this weekly Sabbath to the ending of the Sabbath so they would have gone out right at that time and they would have cut that sheaf the bulk of the work that they would have done would have been reserved to go into the first day of the week what we typically call as Sunday and a part of this overall preparation after cutting that sheaf was then they would go through the process of a 
um, a threshing, a, a crushing. They used actually either a board or they used a, a, a real hammer to crush out the kernels of barley. And it would create a, a fine a powder form. And that would be what would be actually presented on the next morning. And we know from the writings that we see the, the Sadducees were in control of what went on in the temple at that time, during the time frame when Christ was walking this earth, during that second temple period. And they actually have documented a lot of the information that we're making reference to here. One of the things that was interesting that they did with this was they actually would take this powder form of this offering and they put it in a big bowl and the bowl would then be waved. Now you think, how could you possibly wave a bowl? Well, it was tilted forward and it went in all four directions. So you would have a tilt to the east, to the west, to the north, to the south. And that was showing the totality of the offering being made to God. And it's interesting when we think about this because the amount that was to be offered was the omer. And the omer had a very significant amount associated to that because when you consider the fact that the instructions given during this time frame of Leviticus chapter 23 would have been while the Israelites were still in the wilderness, had not yet gone into the promised land. So they were already being programmed to think of how this particular event would be something they would do in the future, as well as point to something far greater that with all candor, they probably did not realize at the time what they were doing or the significance of what they were doing, probably more appropriate. But I go back to that amount because the amount of this offering was just as important. We know that when the Israelites were journeying on their journey into the promised land, that there was manna provided, manna that came, God provided it, and, and it was bread from heaven, as we see. And actually, when you look in Exodus chapter 16, verse 32, Moses was told the Israelite priesthood that they were to take an omer full of that manna and it was to be kept and was one of the components of the actual Ark of the Covenant. But it was to be kept there so that future generations would see that bread and know that that was the bread that God had fed them in the wilderness when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Somewhat like a representation of remembering what I provided for you. And of course, we realize that that was the God of the Old Testament, none other than Jesus Christ as well. So during the period of time until they actually crossed over into the promised land, they rehearsed or knew of something that they would be doing in the future. And in fact, when we go forward to Joshua chapter 5, we'll read verses 10 through 15 because there's connection to the manna as well. It says in verse 5, or verse 10 rather, of chapter 5, while the sons of Israel camped at Gilgal, they observed the Passover on the evening of the 14th day of the month on the desert plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. Of course, that would be obviously following the instruction of the first day of unleavened bread. So they were eating unleavened cakes and they were also eating what was already produced in the land. They didn't plant it, but that was what was already given as a, or, or planted rather by the other inhabitants. So it was somewhat of a gift. Verse 12, the manna ceased on the day after that they had eaten some of the produce of the land so that the sons of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate some of the yield of the land of Canaan during that year. Now it came about that when Joshua was by Jericho, 
that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, rather, I indeed come now as the captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the ground and bowed down and said to him, What has my Lord to say to his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Significant there because we know this was not an angel. We know this was one of the God beings because he was told that where he was at was holy ground. We know from Moses in the burning bush, another time for which he was told to take his shoes off or his sandals because he was on holy ground. It seems apparent that this was Jesus Christ as well in a human form. So we see that with these days that there is connection to manna. There's the amount that was a part of what was to be offered. And we see that Jesus Christ once again comes on the scene and appears as this period of time is associated with this wave sheaf offering. Now it is interesting when we consider the fact that the term first of the first fruits is a term that comes from Exodus 23, 19 and Exodus 34, 26. It contains that phrase, first of the first fruits. When we look at Numbers, chapter 28, verse 26, there's a reference that's given relative to Pentecost, which is a part of that counting that was referenced earlier in Leviticus 23, that is a significant point for what we're at or where we're at right now because the, our current weekly Sabbath has ended. So we now will begin the counting of the 50 days going to the seven complete Sabbaths before we will come to that holy day that was referenced in verse 21 of Leviticus 23, which is none other than Pentecost, which is the day of the first fruits. So we see there has to be a beginning point of when the first fruits would begin to be harvested. And it is interesting when you consider it that if the first fruits were the early part of the harvest, then the first of the first fruits would have to come before that and be an earlier portion of that early harvest. We also see that the wave sheaf offering appears to represent that small, very initial first harvest, oftentimes referred to agriculturally as the barley. The first fruits that would come a little bit later would be that of the wheat. And of course, we know that with the wheat, there are the examples that Jesus Christ would give in the parables regarding um, the, the parable of the wheat and the tares. But we see that with the cutting of the wave sheaf, there is the beginning of accounting that goes to the next holy day, the day of first fruits, Pentecost. But it all begins with this earlier part of the, of the first fruit harvest. And that is the harvest that occurred as the Sabbath was ending. And then there would, it would result from that being threshed and then offered the next morning. And the next morning would be when that omer of that offering occurred. Now, it is interesting that from the reasons that we see that spiritually, the New Testament adds much of the meaning that oftentimes when we look in the Old Testament, we have outlines, but we have the parallels, the understanding, the application of the expanding of the meaning going beyond just the physical activities to the why behind the what. And when we consider this, this is a, a major step in unfolding the understanding because the Old Testament and all the festivals that God lists in Leviticus 23 do revolve around an agricultural harvest. But in the New Testament, those same agricultural harvests are expounded upon in meaning to then go to God's spiritual harvest of souls into his very kingdom. 
And just as we were mentioning just a few moments ago regarding the first of the first fruits and how that's listed in Exodus and Numbers, when we go to the New Testament, we don't quite see the same identical words, but the same principles apply. In fact, when we see it listed there, it's going to be the firstborn among many brethren. We find that in Romans, Romans chapter 8, verse 29. The Apostle Paul was speaking, and he's speaking to the church about the church. He says, for those whom he foreknown, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he, the son, would be the firstborn among many brethren. Just as the same symbol was used as the first of the first fruits and the harvest in Exodus, we see in Romans the Apostle Paul explaining that there is a spiritual harvest and Jesus Christ, the Son, is the firstborn among many brethren to be born. And that is a parallel and a connection that has importance. In fact, when we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we see even more evidence of this same principle in place. And I'll read verses 20 through 24 in 1 Corinthians 15. But no, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all died, so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. I've always found it a little interesting here because understand that in the original text, it's our understanding in that language of, of Greek. In this case, there was no punctuation. What you see in your Bible is an English translation and punctuation has been added. And oftentimes punctuation is added to help us better understand. In this case, I think what we really could have to be the most accurate is you would say in verse 23, Christ, comma, the first fruits, comma, and after that, those who are Christ at his coming. And it would seem to be very consistent with Romans 8 as well as Exodus and what we've seen there. Verse 24 says, Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom of God, uh, oh, hand over the kingdom to God the Father, when he has ab abolished all rule and all authority and power. So we see that this is truly a picture in the New Testament of the harvesting of souls for the kingdom of God. The Apostle James adds a little more color to this and I think helps us to be able to grasp a little more an understanding in James chapter 1 and we'll read here verses 17 and 18. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of light with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we could be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. You know, James certainly is drawing, if, if, if the Apostle Paul couldn't draw the connection, or the lines connecting the dots, James definitely did right here. And we see that there's even a futuristic connecting of the dots in Revelation. Revelation chapter 14, verse 4. And of course, this is the Apostle John who is giving, the, or giving a, a dream. And he is given the future in this dream that is the book of Revelation. And here in verse 4 of Revelation 14, we read these are the ones who have been not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been purchased from among men as firstfruits to God and to the Lamb. So we see that there is this direct connection, even futuristically, to individuals that would come even in the future 
and that has continued beyond Jesus Christ, beyond the early New Testament church, all the way through down to now, and then if time goes longer, even beyond that. But we see that there is a harvest. We see that there is a harvest that is the first of the first fruits. There is the first born of many brethren to come. We see a concept. We see an agrarian harvest in the Old Testament expounded upon in meaning with a spiritual harvest in the New Testament. And we see that there is unity and consistency of message. We see that Jesus Christ is woven throughout all of this. I find it interesting that even when we go deeper, we see that the true wave sheaf offering, as it was cut down, as the Sabbath was ending, as it would be crushed and it would be offered before God, is truly an offering that is a representation of Jesus Christ himself. You know, I know that this year, the way the holy days fell, they didn't fall quite in the same manner, but we know in the year in which Jesus Christ died, that he did die apparently on a Wednesday evening, was put in the grave, and then would have been presented to the Father as the first of the first fruits, the firstborn of many brethren to come on a Sunday morning. And we have that because we have a lot of scriptures to point to this. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, a prophecy that Daniel was given pointing to Jesus Christ, and he will make a firm covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to the sacrifice and the grain offerings. When we start going back to give a re a, an understanding of Jesus Christ being who he said he was by the sign that he gave of he was who he said he was, we would have to go back. And so if we go back from his representation to the ladies that he presented or saw him on that Sunday morning, then we would know that it, it would three days and three nights would take you back to him being put in the grave on a Wednesday evening, the middle of the week. We also know that there's some inferences that are given in John's gospel account that are very important for us to consider on the week in which this actually occurred. This, I mean, the actual death of Jesus Christ and his representation of that wave sheep offering on that Sunday morning, as we would call it, three days and three nights later. But in John chapter 19, we'll look in verses 31 and then verses 38 through 42. Then the Jews, because it was the preparation day so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, meaning it's not the weekly Sabbath, it's pointing to one of the annual Sabbaths that are listed as holy days in Leviticus 23. And they asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken down. So they wanted to do something on the preparation day, which would have been, in this particular case, um, the high day would have been on a Thursday. And we see that Jesus was already dead, as you continue on in that story, so they did not break his bones. And that was another fulfillment of prophecy, by the way. But in verse 39, it says, After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate granted permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture of mirth and aloes in about a hundred pounds weight. This was a part of the burial process that it was a part of what they did at that time. Verse 40, so they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrappings with the spices and its burial custom of the Jews. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb, which no one had been laid in yet. And therefore, because of this Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. So we see and have, again, some more timing markers to help us to better understand the timing. If we look at Mark chapter 15, we see in verse 42 
when evening had already come because it was a preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. So evening had come, he had died, they put him in the grave. And of course, we know from the uh, many times we've looked at scriptures that there is the sign that Jesus gave. And the sign that he referenced is, is what we see in Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12. And Matthew chapter 12, we see that he gives this, uh, he says, you know, you, you seek an evil and adulterous generation, craves for a sign, yet no sign will be given but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea creature, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So we, we reference these previous scriptures to show that it would be three days and three nights. And the only way you get three days and three nights is by truly coming to the end of Saturday evening of that week near sunset when that wave sheaf would have been cut because it was the weekly Sabbath after the holy day. And as a result of that, we see that God the Father himself broke the death bonds that were on Jesus Christ physically, utilizing the power of the Holy Spirit to resurrect Jesus. And when he was resurrected, he resurrected him back to the state of this, that he had been in prior to being a human being. So the Father fulfilled the promise and resurrected Jesus Christ. And that was that cutting down of the sheaf that points to this counting of the Sabbaths. When we look at Matthew chapter 28, we'll begin here in verse 1. Now, after the Sabbath, as it had begun to dawn towards the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. And behold, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. And there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Now, when we look at all of the gospel accounts, we see different aspects and components of the story being added. That add, when you read them together and you put them in a right order, a complete picture. And one thing that is important, I think, when you consider some of this story is when you look at Luke chapter 24 and beginning in verse 3, there's a little more detail added. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. In other words, they, Luke is saying they looked in the tomb and the body wasn't there. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in a dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the, the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful man and be crucified, and the third day ri rise again? And they remembered his words, and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven, at the, at, to the, all the rest. Now, they were Mary Magdalene and Joanne and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them, telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they didn't believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen wrappings only. And he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. Truly a miraculous event. Let's go to John chapter 20. There's a little more detail in this story. In John chapter 20, we'll begin in verse 10. 
So the disciples went away again to their homes, but Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the foot where the body of Jesus had been laying. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I'll take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned to him in Hebrew, Rabino, which means teacher. Obviously, she recognized at that point. She didn't recognize the original state that he had been resurrected into, but now she knew by that, that the, the verbiage. Verse 17, Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and, and he had said these things to her. It is important there because we see that while Jesus Christ had been resurrected, most likely as the Sabbath was ending, as that sheaf would have been cut, he was yet to be presented as would, we saw earlier based on the second temple arrangements when that the grinding of that particular wave sheep offering would be put in that bowl and presented, then Jesus would be presenting himself to the Father, but he hadn't quite done it yet. So it was before that period of time when Mary Magdalene came in contact with him. There is no doubt, though, when we consider the story and all the aspects of the story of what we've seen to this point, very interesting story, very riveting story, but not just a good story, a story that holds hope, a story that holds hope for you and holds hope for me. You know, when we look at Revelation chapter 5, no doubt, as Jesus would have been presented and presenting himself to the Father in the very throne room, the very temple of God, we see an announcement made, and we see with that great praise. And no doubt, when the Father would have had Jesus Christ coming back home, so to speak, in heaven, in the very throne room, it was no doubt a very joyous event. Here in Revelation 5, we see in verse 11, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was a myriad of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying in a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. You know, no doubt that reunion, that reunion was a, a very joyous event and a, an event for which there was all kinds of happiness, all kinds of rejoicing going on. But yet I say at the same time, this is important for you and important for me. And while the, the very idea that this wave sheaf offering is something that is oftentimes obscured by what is called Christianity around us, we do think it very important to acknowledge what this event pictures, because it pictures something wonderful as the first of the first fruits was presented to the Father. And it is important because this is who we put our faith and hope in. You know, when the day of Pentecost came to the early church in Acts chapter 2, the apostle Peter gave a very profound sermon that particular day when the Holy Spirit came with power and the power that resulted in them as the disciples of Jesus Christ to be able to go forward with the gospel message. But in that message, in Acts chapter 2, Peter makes it very, very plain as to 
who resurrected Jesus Christ. In verse 24 of Acts 2, but God raised him again putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. And death is a power. It is a power on the physical human, but it is not something that an all-powerful heavenly father cannot break through, which he did. Verse 32 of Acts 2 says, This Jesus God raised up again, to which all, or we are all witnesses, and then in chapter 3 of verse 15, but put to death the prince of, of life, Jesus himself, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. So we see clearly by the very words of, of the apostle Peter that it was God the Father who resurrected Jesus Christ. And we know there is an order. We've already read that in 1 Corinthians 15. There is an order with Christ first, then the first fruits, and then later those who are alive when Jesus Christ returns at his coming. So there is a precise order that goes with this, but it starts with Jesus Christ. It starts with the wave sheep offering. And there is hope for us that should we die before Jesus Christ returns, that there will be a resurrection. In fact, Jesus went to great lengths to make sure that that is identified for us in Scripture. In John chapter 11, very um, profound words given at the time when Lazarus dies. And in verse 23 of John 11, Jesus said to Martha, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And anyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now, of course, that last statement, he's not talking about physical because we will physically die or be changed. But we see that it, that it is he that is the resurrection for us. He is the one that will resurrect us. And that is further uh, articulated in John chapter 6, verse 39. This is the will of him, Jesus speaking, of the Father who sent me, that all that he has given me I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on that last day. No one can come to me, in verse 44, unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. And in verse 54, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. You know, at this time of year, when we consider all the ramifications of the Passover, we consider as well the ramifications of the wave sheep offering. I think it's important for us to acknowledge this. On the surface, because it's truly not one of the holy days listed, but it still has a profound importance that should not be lost among all the activities of the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread. And while it is lost among most of what's called Christianity in the world around us, it's important for us to stop, acknowledge, memorialize, and consider what occurred on this great event when, G when the Father resurrected Jesus Christ. How significant that is. And the true significance of it is the beginning of the spiritual work of harvesting many more human beings in the future through Jesus Christ. You know, as we enter into the time period between now, right now, the wave sheaf offering and Pentecost, it's important for us to realize and use carefully that ever shrinking amount of time that we have in this life and we must come to the full measure and the stature of the fullness of Jesus Christ. It's important for us. you got to start somewhere. It starts with this great time. With that, I'd like for us to close with a prayer. So if you'll bow your heads. 
Our Heavenly Father, we come before you. We give you thanks for and acknowledge this great event, this great event that would have occurred so that you would have resurrected Jesus Christ back to life through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then you would set him to have all authority and all power. We put our whole faith, trust, and confidence in the partaking of the bread, the partaking of the wine, the partaking of those symbols that are the body and blood of Jesus Christ and symbol. And we know that we only have eternal life through those sacraments. And we come to you and we give you thanks and acknowledge the great event that occurred with the wave sheaf offering. And we look forward to our day of resurrection, our day of changing from this mortal to immortality. We thank you for the hope. We thank you for this. We acknowledge you and acknowledge the great gift. And we thank you and ask all of this. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the evening and think through tomorrow what significant events occurred with this great time that we're acknowledging tonight. Have a good night.